Thank you for joining us today. Today we have joining us from Lübeck in Germany, Dr. Maggie Banis Palokowski. Uh, Dr. Maggie, thankfully, you will be give us, giving us a talk about localization of non purple uh, breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. Maggie, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for having me here uh, and also for this really nice topic um, because uh, localization of non palpable breast cancer has been my uh, research focus for the last uh, couple of years. So can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, I, I work in Lübeck in northern Germany, and uh, most of you will be surprised when I say that I'm a gynecologist. This is something that's uh, very uh, German, and actually only in the German-speaking countries I've heard of this. Uh, but in Germany, all breast uh, surgeons are, in fact, gynecologists. And since we as gynecologists also do a lot of uh, ultrasound, um, it's obvious that we have um, uh, a really strong interest in localization techniques as well, because we are also, also responsible, at least partly, for the diagnostics of breast cancer. In um, uh, Germany, we work in certified breast cancer centers. We have 250 breast cancer centers uh, in the whole country. And each year we receive a report. Uh, and in the last year, I just checked 56% of cancers that we operated uh, in the country were either T1 or DCIS. And uh, this means that for most of our patients, we need some form of localization technique. And um, adding to these very small cancers that are usually non-palpable, we have obviously cancers that were first large and maybe palpable, but uh, shrink due to neoadjuvant chemotherapy that is quite popular here in this part of Europe. Um, so our guidelines, we have um, national guidelines. One of them is the S3 guideline, and the second one is called AGO Breast Committee um, that is also available in English. I am on both guideline panels, and uh, we always say that if a lesion is non-palpable, we require some form of imaging-guided marking. And as you see, as an example, we state here, uh, we mentioned here the wire that has traditionally been uh, the German way of doing this. So uh, most uh, women operated on with breast cancer receive wire guidance over here. And if a patient receive, receives neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they usually receive a clip uh, marking before uh, the chemotherapy starts. So the wire guided localization is of course the oldest technique available. Uh, I would love to discuss this with you in the end. I'm very curious to know which localization techniques you use in Egypt. Uh, but as I said before, in Germany, most centers use wire guidance. This is the best established form of localization, the oldest one, and it is suitable for all lesions. You can use wire guidance for uh, lesions visible upon ultrasound, mammography, but also on MRI. But obviously, as surgeons, you know that wire guidance has some disadvantages, uh, especially in terms of logistics, because we all know that if a patient receives a, a wire, um, especially if you uh, place your wires on the same day of surgery, usually you can't use the first slot in the theater, and you always have to coordinate uh, the diagnostic uh, part, the radiologist, and the surgical part. For patients, it is an invasive procedure and there is a potential for uh, dislocation of the wire. And the topics that we are talking about recently a lot um, are also the potential of removing unnecessary tissue. Of course, in the end, we would like to remove uh, as little healthy tissue as possible, would like to remove the tumor located centrally in the specimen. Um, so, of course, the volume of excised tissue, the so-called resection ratio, and the margin rate are also topics that are very are becoming really interesting to us. Uh, when I first started, uh, started researching this topic uh, around 10 years ago, uh, I actually knew that there was a wire. <laughs> I knew that you can also use ultrasound in the surgical uh, theater, but I have never heard of any other localization technique because, as I said, in Germany, they're not very popular. And then we started with my research group to uh, work on these 
uh, this topic and I found out that in, um, uh, well, outside of Germany, in many countries, new probe guided detection techniques are actually not only popular, but are becoming standard uh, and replacing the wire guidance quite quickly. So I would like to present to you all these techniques. Um, and this is a slide from our, our AGO breast committee guideline. This is a guideline that is updated every year. Uh, we always publish the uh, current version of the guideline in March. So what I'm showing you, it's from March 2024. And this guideline consists of over 600 slides like this on all possible topics. One of the sections is uh, surgical uh, therapy and another one is oncoplastic surgery. Um, and as I said before, I'm on this guideline panel and I usually, I, I use these uh, guidelines a lot in my clinical practice. So as you see, we obviously have the wire guided localization because this is a technique that many of us use and it is graded double plus. So a technique that is considered standard. And then the second one that has also been awarded a double plus recommendation is the intraoperative ultrasound, a technique that is used by many German hospitals and um, that has shown significant advantages. My research group has conducted a meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials uh, in non-palpable breast cancer. And we could show that patients receiving intraoperative ultrasound guided resection have significantly higher rate of negative margins compared to patients using wire guidance. Uh, and all randomized studies have, uh, have shown this actually. So how do we do this? We can take our ultrasound machine into the OR. In my OR, we have the best ultrasound machine of all uh, all machines that, that we have, actually. Uh, you can use special probes like this hockey stick probe that I'm showing you here, but you can also use a very uh, normal, a very typical uh, linear uh, ultrasound probe. It is very important to use enough gel between the sterile sheet, uh, sheath and um, the probe. Um, and when, once your team is, um, is used to this uh, concept, it actually uh, goes quite quickly. So in my department, we have ultrasound machine uh, in all breast surgeries, maybe with the exception of simple mastectomies, but uh, in case of a breast conserving surgery, the uh, sterile nurse always uh, prepares ultrasound as well, and it takes around 30 seconds and they're done. So uh, practically, you have to, of course, uh, first see where your lesion is. And I took these pictures without the sterile drape so that you can uh, see better what I'm actually doing. First, I uh, visualize the lesion in its maximum diameter. Then with the sterile pen, I draw on the skin on both sides of the probe. Then I turn my probe 90 degrees. I again visualize the lesion in the middle of my screen and in its maximum diameter. And then I place to us uh, two additional drawings on both sides of the probe and then uh, a cross is built and then I usually also check with my probe turned 45 degrees just to check if um, if uh, I'm actually seeing the lesion and then during the surgery uh, you can take your sterile probe and check the lesion again so usually uh, I use the probe every now and then every couple of minutes just to ensure the margins and then in the end, uh, of course, we perform specimen, <clears throat> sorry, specimen uh, ultrasound. <clears throat> These are some examples of uh, lesions that are actually quite suitable to perform intraoperative ultrasound. Um, we uh, usually use intraoperative ultrasound for lesions that are sonographically visible, but also for clips, especially if these are larger clips that are uh, vis uh, um, identifiable upon ultrasound and after you remove the specimen you can uh, perform specimen ultrasound immediately and see all the borders all the margins of your specimen <laughs> uh, if your sterile gel uh, is um, is not if you don't have sterile gel or if you used all of it you can of course use water as well. Water is a very effective medium for ultrasound um, uh, waves as well. So you can use both techniques depending on if you have enough sterile gel um, in the theater or not. A very important aspect when you're talking about intraoperative ultrasound 
uh, are obviously the uh, challenges that we might encounter uh, using this technique. So this is very important to know which lesions are suitable to use intraoperative ultrasound. Obviously, lesions that do not have an ultrasound uh, identifiable component, like microcalcifications, for example, should not uh, be uh, visualized using this technique. And I always recommend that the surgeon should examine the patient himself or herself before surgery so that he or she ensures that the lesion is really visual, uh, uh, vi um, uh, visualized uh, using ultrasound. Um, so we need adequate training for the surgeon and also adequate equipment in the surgical room. And if you would like to try um, this technique, I don't know if you're familiar with intraoperative ultrasound, maybe you're also experienced using this, but if you, if you have colleagues who would like to start with this, I always recommend uh, to start slowly and uh, stay on the safe side. So first, start with larger lesions, uh, maybe lesions that you can almost palpate, not very small lesions, not clips, um, and um, first use intraoperative ultrasound as an additional tool. For example, you can still place the wire, but then in addition, use ultrasound just to check if you would be able to visualize the lesion if you have not placed the wire before. Uh, and also very important, if you see the patient in the outpatient clinic when you're planning the surgery, uh, document the localization of the uh, lesion uh, exactly on my ultrasound machines in our breast cancer department. In On all machines, um, uh, we programmed that just with two clicks, you can document the localization of the lesion. So here, as you can see, nine hours, four centimeters uh, distance to the nipple. And with two clicks, you know where the lesion is supposed to be. Uh, we have to be very cautious in case of patients who have large hematomas, because sometimes uh, you um, see the patient in the outpatient clinic and you think that the lesion is uh, really well visible, but it's the hematoma. So when she comes back for surgery one week or two weeks later, the hematoma might be gone and then you will have problems visualizing the lesion. So this is something to keep in mind. And in Germany, a very co a concept that is becoming quite popular recently is a preoperative endocrine therapy. So this is endocrine therapy that we give for a short duration of time, usually three to four weeks only. And it is given with the aim to check uh, key I67 proliferation marker of uh, tumor cells. Um, so to check if this proliferation index is, um, is reduced is falling due to endocrine therapy. And um, even uh, given this very short duration of therapy, sometimes the lesion change their sonomorphology and sometimes they become smaller. So they might actually be <clears throat> quite a challenge to find upon ultrasound, uh, even if at first you thought the that the lesion is uh, a very suitable lesion. Second, the surgeon uh, needs to have uh, ultrasound experience. This is uh, obvious. And I always recommend to see the patient um, uh, personally before surgery, a couple of days before surgery, just to just for a final check if the lesion is suitable, um, suitable for removal <clears throat> using intraoperative ultrasound. A third point uh, is who owns the ultrasound machine. So sometimes the ultrasound machine is owned by the anesthesia department and you just borrow, borrow it. Um, so it might happen that, for example, if in the theater near your theater, um, an anesthesiologist is placing a central IV and he needs the ultrasound machine. Uh, but your patient is already under anesthesia, so you can't start because you don't know where the lesion is. <clears throat> These are the aspects that you have to keep in mind and um, always stay, from the, stay on the safe side. If you don't have your own ultrasound machine, um, then intraoperative ultrasound and omitting, for example, wire guidance is not such a good idea. And always, always, always talk to your diagnosticians. Uh, usually they are radiologists, but in Germany, uh, in some diagnostics departments, uh, gynecologists work. So sometimes we place our own wires, uh, but it's always good to talk to these colleagues so that they are informed that you're trying a new localization technique. What about palpable lesions? Actually, there have been some randomized studies that compared intraoperative ultrasound with palpation only. And again, in this meta-analysis, we could show that the negative margin rate is significantly higher if you use intraoperative ultrasound compared to palpation alone. 
And in one study, I found it particularly interesting, um, the colleagues from Holland, from the Netherlands, examined the volume of excised tissue. So patients were randomized between intraoperative ultrasound and palpation. And then the volume of excised tissue was also uh, measured. And they found out that using palpation alone, a lot more tissue is excised, but the negative margin rate is lower. So obviously, if we rely on palpation alone, we remove more tissue. This is not necessary, but still our tumor is not located, located centrally. And we all know that removing more volume, more tissue can reduce the cosmetic outcome. And in this study, they looked at this aspect uh, as well, and they found out that patient satisfaction with cosmetic outcome was lower in patients who received palpation guided surgery. Uh, so a very interesting uh, cobalt trial from the Netherlands. And I have brought you an example. It is a patient of mine who is in the intensified surveillance program due to her BRCA1 mutation. She's very young. She has very small breasts, uh, very dense breasts, and she has uh, a fibroadenoma. It has been confirmed upon core needle biopsy, so actually we could leave the, uh, the, this lesion uh, alone, but the patient wishes an excision of this lesion because she has some pain. And as you know, in dense breasts, it's actually quite easy to uh, mistake the lesion the, or the, the very dense tissue for a lesion. So sometimes you remove unnecessarily uh, much too much tissue, and here we uh, performed intraoperative ultrasound. You see my finger coming from the right side. And here I am touching the lesion, the fibroadenoma confirmed upon core needle biopsy. Um, and I don't want to risk removing unnecessarily her healthy but very dense tissue, especially because she has very small breasts. So intraoperative ultrasound is a very nice technique for these patients as well. What about the learning curve? How much time do you have to invest if you would like to introduce intraoperative ultrasound? There have been some studies looking into that, particularly from the Spanish group by um, Isabel Rubio, who is our current president of the European um, Society of Surgical Oncology, of the ESO, and uh, her colleague Antonio Esqueva. So they looked into it and they found out that one needs 11 cases um, to acquire skills that are enough to perform intraoperative ultrasound. Uh, in my opinion, if you're a skilled ultrasound examiner, uh, it might be even less, but if you've, you have not performed ultrasound before, I would um, suspect the number to be higher. Um, and there are curricula offered by, for example, ESSO or BRESSO, International Organization um, for Surgeons who would like to dedicate themselves to ultrasound, especially in the theater. And obviously, when we're talking about this um, topic, we have to keep in mind that the um, challenges that the surgeons encounter might be different depending on the country they come from. In Germany, it is quite easy to take ultrasound machine into the OR because we as gynecologists perform a lot of diagnostics. Uh, performing ultrasound is part of our curriculum during our uh, specialty training. So it's just one person who holds the ultrasound probe and also performs the surgery. But in many countries, this might mean that you have to invite a radiologist or a sonographer with you into the theater before you can learn the technique. So it might be somewhat uh, difficult and I would be thrilled to hear how you do this in Egypt after my talk. And as you can see, there are plenty <clears throat> other techniques that you can offer your patients uh, uh, right now. Um, they are listed here. And I will talk briefly about each of these techniques, but what they have in common, they are all, all probe guided. Probe guided means um, that you um, that you place a marker into the patient, into the lesion, and then you detect it using a special probe. And um, now, uh, Hisham, maybe you could tell me if you can hear a sound. No. Do you hear something? No, okay, but just... we know it, we have it. Yeah, okay, we... wonderful. Let me just share again, because I want you to hear the, the sound as well. Just okay. one second. We used to have the Sentinella. Do you know the yes, Sentinella? It, it, yes, do you mean a gamma probe or which one? Yeah. But, or Mark but, Trace? Uh, no, it, it was called Sentinella. It was gamma. Uh, it, it had a gamma probe, but now it's not working anymore. It needs uh, maintenance. Okay, 
Do you hear it now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So this is a marker called Max Seed. Um, and of course, during surgery, you can also use it again just to check if your marker is inside. In case of Max Seed, the number you see goes higher when you are approaching the lesion. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there is an acoustic signal. Okay, and Maxit is a paramagnetic marker, meaning it's not a permanent magnet. It, get, it gets magnetized when you use your probe, uh, so it allows you for an intraoperative detection. It is approved for long-term use uh, in soft tissue as well, so you can use it in the axilla as well if you'd like, but it's not, um, it's not uh, a sentinel um, a tool. It's a tool for detecting the lesion or marked lymph nodes. Uh, the advantage is it doesn't lose, sig lose signal over time, so you can use it even in case of a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. It has a very low nickel content, so uh, you don't risk an, uh, an allergy. But the disadvantage in case of all magnetic markers uh, are MRI artifacts. And this is the largest problem because if you place this marker, this small clip, and then you try to perform the MRI, you will have this huge 8 to 10 centimeter bloom <laughs> where you are looking for the marker. Um, so, for example, in the neoadjuvant setting, if you use MRI to control your patients, to check your lesions, uh, you will not be able to do this. And this is something you have to know, you have to check before you place such a marker. Uh, usually you can't use metallic instruments when you're using this specific form of a marker because it leads to interference. And in case of oral probe guided detection techniques, if a lesion is very, very deep, uh, you might have problems um, uh, looking for it. The Maxit marker is the first marker that um, had a phase three randomized trial conducted, a large uh, phase three um, a trial. It has been conducted by Andreas Karakatsanis from Sweden, a very esteemed colleague uh, who, uh, who I have the pleasure of working with on another study. So in this study, they took um, more than 400 patients and they randomized them between Maxit, the Maxit marker, and the wire guidance. And they found out that the reexcision rate was similar. So the negative margin rate was identical in both arms. The resection ratio, the volume of the tissue excites, excised was similar, but Maxit was better in terms of less localization failure and shorter duration of surgery. And they asked all people involved. They asked the surgeon, the radiologist, and also the surgical coordinators uh, what the technique they liked more. And they all voted for Maxit. So this is the first time that we at the AGO Breast Committee guideline panel uh, graded a probe guided detection technique with a plus for the first time. Before that, it was always plus minus, meaning that it's an individual choice, but with a plus, it's a clear recommendation. What else do we have? We have also markers that are permanent magnets, like this marker from the uh, company Sirius Medical. The marker is called Sirius Pintuition. It's very small. It is also approved for breast and for the axilla and also, also for long-term use, meaning that you can place it before new advent chemotherapy. <clears throat> um, the main advantage here is, and I would like to show you a short film, it shows you uh, well, it gives you an acoustic signal. It shows you also the distance to the to the marker in millimeters, but it also shows you if you have to uh, move your probe to the left or to the right. So if it's green, you know that you are uh, nearly looking at the lesion. And at some point, I will tell you when, now. If you, if you see this sign, it means that you are directly before the lesion. And you also, as I said before, see the distance, like, for example, 20 millimeters from the lesion. So this is also a very nice technique to work with. Uh, again, the potential, the main problem, uh, since it's a magnetic detection, are MRI artifacts. In case of this marker, you can use metallic instruments, um, so they do not cause any interference. But if you are very near the marker, it might just fly to your scissors or whatever you use to your clamp because it's uh, made of metal and the marker is a permanent magnet. So this is something you have to think about uh, when you are nearing the lesion. 
Another commercially available marker are uh, radar reflectors. So um, markers uh, working with infrared light technology. Um, these are quite long markers, 12 millimeters large. They have two antennas. And the commercially available system is called Savvy Scout from the firma, from the company Merit Medical. Um, so um, here you don't have this MRI artifact problem. Um, and just that you see how it works, I also took a video of this. So this is actually um, a localization of the axilla. I placed the marker into the lymph node before neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and now I'm looking for this specific target lymph node. But it would uh, it would work exactly the same in the breast. And the fourth commercially available device uh, is the radio frequency identification tag or radio frequency identification device. Um, also, a marker that is quite long, 11, 11 millimeters. It is only approved for breast, not for the axilla. In the axilla, it's off label. Um, and this is the only marker where a marker has its own unique number. So if you look for the marker using a probe, um, the number will show. <clears throat> and if you have placed two or three markers in one patient, you will be um, actually during detection able to say which marker has been used. Whether this is an advantage in the clinical uh, practice and the daily practice, uh, I'm not sure, but it's also a nice, a nice touch. And coming back to the MRI artifacts, they might be huge in case of magnetic markers. In case of radio frequency identification devices, they are quite large, uh, making um, any uh, form of tumor response assessment during the adjuvant chemotherapy not really possible. But the radar reflectors, they uh, cause minimal artifacts, so they can be safely used during the adjuvant setting. And we also have a quite an, quite an old technique that is very popular, for example, in Finland, in Holland, <clears throat> uh, in the UK, but also in the US, United States, the radioactive seeds. Radioactive seeds mean that you place a very small uh, iodine seed into the lesion, uh, and then you have to remove it using a gamma probe. Uh, it's a very nice, uh, nice idea because you use the same gamma probe for the sentinel, node biopsy, but also to remove your marker. So you just need one probe and not two or three different probes. The problem is that it works with radioactivity. In Germany, we're not allowed to use radioactive seeds for diagnostic purposes. So um, the only experience I have with, it, with this technique is uh, from abroad. In Germany, we don't do this, <clears throat> but this is a very nice and well-documented method with a high level of evidence from randomized studies. Um, but it means that you have to have a, radio, um, a radiation department. Um, and of course, you have to always know where the seeds are. You cannot lose a, a radioactive seed because then usually the radiation uh, authorities will uh, be talking to you. And this is the last technique that I would like to show you. There is also a technique that is based on radioactivity. And you mentioned the sentinel lymph node biopsy before. So I imagine that you injected uh, technetium, uh, a radioactive tracer, into the breast before looking for the sentinel lymph node using a gamma probe. So imagine you take this technetium, this, this radioactive tracer, and you inject it directly into the tumor. That way, you can localize your tumor using the gamma probe and you can also localize the sentinel lymph node. Um, and when you combine these techniques, usually they are called SNOL. Roll would mean you remove just the tumor, but if you also remove the sentinel lymph node biopsy at the same time, uh, it is a technique called SNOL. The disadvantage is that you have to place your tracer one day before surgery or on the day of surgery, so you do not have this time uh, flexibility that we actually are looking for. Um, but some countries, like, for example, Turkey, they use it a lot. 
And since there are so many localization techniques, uh, my study group, UBREST, and the UK study group, IBRANET, decided to join forces and we initiated the MELODY study. Uh, MELODY stands for Methods for Localization of Different Types of Breast Lesions, and the study is being supported by the Oncoplastic Breast Consortium, by the AGOB, by the, uh, by the AWO Gynae, and also Senator from Turkey, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, and the Korean uh, Breast Study Group. So the study is uh, running in many different countries, and we decided to start it because there are so many different techniques, but as we know, the randomized uh, controlled trials are very scarce. Um, and in most available studies, there is a potential risk of bias because most of the studies are just retrospective cohort studies, usually sponsored by the manufacturer. So um, we cannot exclude a bias. This is the QR code and the link for this study. The study is a prospective non-interventional multicenter cohort study. We uh, would like to accrue in total 7,500 patients. And we started last year and the enrollment is progressing very nicely. Uh, patients who can participate have either invasive breast cancer or DCIS, and they are scheduled to receive breast conserving surgery, and they receive an imaging guided localization. We have two pri co-primary endpoints. The first one is, does it work? Am I able to remove a lesion that I would like to remove using a specific technique? And the second one are, of course, the margins. And then we have uh, numerous secondary endpoints, for example, the feasibility, the costs, um, the rate of uh, uh, re-excision of secondary mastectomy, how much volume do we remove, so the uh, resection ratio, and we would like to look at different perspectives. So there is also a short questionnaire for the patient, for the surgeon, and for the radiologist, because probably you 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 had uh you use different techniques and uh sometimes the surgeon is very enthusiastic and loves the technique but the radiologist says oh no i don't like the needle or the other way around so you would like to listen to all uh people involved this is the steering board this is the, a very international study as i said before it is going to take place in probably 30 to 35 countries and this is our current uh, map. We have 99 open study sites in 17 countries. Many countries are in the process of applying for ethical approval. And I have just logged in and checked. We have 1,509 enrolled patients, uh, which means that the accrual is, uh, is uh, according to plan. Egypt is also taking part. Um, there is a colleague from Mansoura who um, joined uh, the study with uh, his study site. And we have also a second study site from Mansoura. And um, these study sites have contributed 15 patients so far. So if you're interested in joining uh, the Melody study, it would be um, lovely. And you can uh, get in touch with us, with our Melody team. Uh, the EU Breast Study Group has been um, founded to strengthen international cross-border cooperation between breast surgeons. So studies like this um, are really a fantastic way to do so. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, I have a few, please, if you have a question, raise your hand. I have a few questions to start with. Um, do you clip all cases? Uh, no, we... Very small tumors we clip during core biopsy because it might be sometimes hard to find them, uh, but this applies to very, very small lesions. Uh, before new adjuvant chemotherapy, yes, we clip all the lesions, um, with the exception of patients who will surely re receive a mastectomy, for example, uh, multicentric yeah. uh, lesions in all quadrants, um, then we will not always clip, but we are very generous with clipping, yeah. Okay. And which localization technique do, uh, is your favorite? Which one do you currently do as a routine? I mean, in your practice? Yeah. So since I am PI of the Melody study, we have all of them. Yes. But um, which one do you prefer? Uh, I myself, uh, I am a fan of intraoperative ultrasound. This is the technique that I, I really like. I am a very experienced sonographer. I um gave a lot of ultrasound workshops and courses. And for me, it was a very natural thing to take 
an ultrasound machine in the OR when I started doing this 10 years ago. Yeah. And in case of lesions that are visible upon ultrasound, uh, we have very robust data from randomized studies showing that this is the technique with the lowest margin rate. So I love uh, performing ultrasound during surgery. In terms of lesions that are not visible upon ultrasound, I see a clear advantage of probe guided detection techniques uh, over wire. Wire makes you very inflexible. You have to schedule the wire uh, placement. Uh, in my hospital, yeah. it happens on the morning of the surgery. But Unfortunately, this means that I, we have. A, yeah. This is the thing we do most these days. Yeah. I mean, a few years ago, we used to have this uh, radio guided Sentinella machine, but now we mm -hmm. just do we just do wire. And we even don't have the, we can't even do Sentinel these days because the dye is not here. Oh, okay. So we don't do uh, even the blue dye? Uh, the, my colleagues don't think the blue dye is, uh, is that accurate. They prefer the, I mean, they're waiting for the proper dye. Yeah. So in, in Germany, we uh, do not recommend using blue dye because our standard is technetium, the radioactive tracer. But do but you use patent have... blue? Well, if we have to use blue, we would use, we would favor patent blue and not yeah. methylene blue, in yes. fact. But both are not, we do not recommend either of them. We recommend technetium with a double plus recommendation in our guidelines or yeah. ICG or MAC trace with one plus recommendation. So many hospitals, especially hospitals that do not have radio um, nuclear medicine department, they are switching to ICG or MAC trace. But the wire is uh, the least expensive uh, mechanism, right? Well, there have been some studies on this and obviously the wire, the, the wire itself is uh, less expensive than a seat or another form of a probe guided detection marker. But if you consider everything, the whole flow in the hospital, transporting the patient somewhere, yeah. waiting for it, sending again the specimen for radiography or ultrasound, there have been actually studies showing that intraoperative ultrasound is the uh, most cost-effective technique. Okay. And there have also been studies showing that, for example, radioactive seeds might be, in fact, less expensive than wires. But it's very difficult from this economic uh, point of view. You have to consider so many factors. Mm. Uh, but as I said before, there have been studies that were quite surprising for me, showing that wire is not the um, the cheapest way to go. Okay. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Dr. Metha, do you have any questions? Any questions, Doctor Methat? The problem is that we 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 are not uh, get we don't get supplies from this radioactive material regularly because of dollar pressure or uh, dollar efficiency, and so we are not uh, that experienced in that we use the, the plain ones like wire localization. <clears throat> Okay. Any questions? Okay, so it was a nice, informative, uh, straightforward talk. So I think nobody has a question. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Maggie, for joining us today. Uh, we will send you the video tomorrow. And uh, right now, uh, I'll send you another link uh, for a brief discussion. Thank you all for joining us and uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Good night.